Ave Maria Purissima. Today we celebrate the external solemnity of the Sacred Heart. Just like with Corpus Christi, it's a feast that's so important, the Church doesn't want anyone to miss it, and so she celebrates it likewise on the Sunday following the feast day. And we see, both with the octave of the Corpus Christi and then the octave of the Sacred Heart, a certain echo of, past, of the Paschal season, right? As we've studied before together, uh, from the great encyclical of Pope Pius XII, uh, Haurietis Aquas, and Pius XI, Miserantissimus Redemptor, on the Sacred Heart, two great encyclicals on the Sacred Heart, they remind us that it's a summary of the whole Catholic religion. It's not just one particular devotion we add on to others, but it's a summary of our whole Christian life and practice and belief. And so that's why it comes as a sort of fitting crown or echo to all the mysteries we've just celebrated, contemplating as it reminds us of our Lord's incarnation and as he assumed our full humanity, even a human heart capable of suffering, feeling all of our emotional uh, sorrow and joys as well, and that that heart is pierced and that his soul is sad even unto death and uh, before the thought of our uh, lack of repentance. And so it summarizes his love for us, that God, the Father, so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son to save us. And that we saw the manifestation of that love in light of what St. Thomas observes is that, again, it wasn't absolutely necessary for God uh, to send his Son to suffer for us, for our salvation. It was necessary to fulfill his promise, which he made. But being God, he could have done it in a million ways, uh, different ways, as he's in debt to no one. So that gives us the key to understanding all that we contemplated during Lent and during Holy Week. It's that all that he suffered and his uh, cruel and ignominious death, he wished to suffer, going beyond what was necessary to not only pay the debt for our sins, but to show us his love and win ours in return. That's why he went to such depths. That's why he suffered uh, uh, his 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 agony in the garden, his scourging at the pillar, his crowning with thorns, his humiliations, his uh, falling with the cross, so as to, and hanging on the cross for three hours. He did all of that for love of you, so that you would love him still more. And then he, ascending into heaven, goes to prepare a mansion for us and sends his very Holy Spirit, so as to uh, live within us still and to guide us to that heavenly fatherland. And so we receive the Holy Spirit, which makes us cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father. But now we can call God, our Father, Daddy, as Christ himself has that, most, that intimate relationship with his Father, being one in essence, though distinct in person. So two, as, as he said, as, as I and the Father are one, may they be one in us, so that he calls us to that same uh, unity uh, with the Father that he enjoys again, by participation in his divine life. And so we can see in the mystery of the Sacred Heart a summary of all of that. And we contemplate, uh, we, it's uh, providential that today we contemplate uh, the Sacred Heart on the same day in which we honor our fathers and their example. For the, for the uh, mystery of fatherhood is the mystery of the Sacred Heart. And we must have that very clear. It was in 2009, in fact, that then Pope Benedict uh, published, uh, dedicated the year to the Sacred Heart, explaining that the mystery of the Sacred Heart is the mystery of the priesthood, of spiritual fatherhood. And so likewise, it applies by analogy to the domestic priest, the father of the family. For we see that our Lord comes as a new Adam. Again, this is how it summarizes our whole faith, as that our Lord comes as a new Adam. Adam, the original Adam, who is the father of all humanity, he, likewise, was endowed by God with so many gifts. He was made according to his image and likeness and given the task to complete creation by being fruitful and multiplying, by tilling and cultivating the earth and ordering all things back to God, being thus the image of God here on this earth. And we see that he, he failed in that duty that he was given as father of the human race, okay, and as husband to his wife. As we, before we see, and although we often think of, well, it was the woman's fault, right? It's exactly what Adam said, okay? Don't try to use that excuse again. It didn't work for Adam. He even blamed it, implicitly blamed God. He said, the woman that you gave me, gave me to eat of the fruit. After they had fallen, God called for one person. Although Eve was the temptress, Adam was the head and responsible. 
If he had not consented, then the whole human race would not have fallen, uh, we can suppose. And so, what was Adam's original sin? When you think back on it, you think, well, wait, I don't, I just don't remember hearing about him. Was he there? It just says that then he took of the fruit and ate that Eve gave her, and was he aware of this? If we go back to the text of Genesis itself, and looking at uh, the Hebrew, for example, or even the Greek and Latin, uh, we see that the devil speaks to them in, in the plural, second person plural, okay? You plural, which would be y'all or yous guys, depending where you're from, up north, or yuns, perhaps even, sorry about that, but um, that, you, that he's speaking to them in the second person plural, implying that Adam is there this whole time. And when it says that Eve gave of him uh, of the fruit to eat, it doesn't say that she called him to come. And one ancient text, too, says that who was there with her then partook of the uh, fruit and ate. And so what was the original sin of Adam? What was he doing? Why, why didn't he say anything? We get a psychological description of Eve's temptation, that she saw that the food was pleasing to the eye, certain species of vanity, that it was uh, delicious to give pleasure, certain species of sensuality, and that it would obtain for her knowledge, certain species of pride. And every woman might, would probably identify that, okay, these are from their mother Eve, they've inherited these certain weak points, right, in terms of their, in their feminine psyche of, of temptation, which are to be understood as a perversion of her talents. With reason, woman is given more to the senses and to, um, and to you know, if a man builds a, a, a house, a woman makes it a home with all her attention to the way things appear, to the beauty, the way things taste. She makes everything delightful as the heart of the family. So we see in her that those same talents she has becomes her weak points when she tries to use them just for herself rather than in the service of others. So now on Father's Day, what will we say about Adam? How would we describe man and his talents? And remember that man and woman, he created them, okay, as the image of God, so as to to image God to the world by their complementarity. Always remember this, because the socialists have not left us, right? They continue with their machinations, which, coming from the devil himself, is always to breed envy, to see our differences as opposed, rich against the poor, race against race, um, whatever, a man against woman, children against their parents. We form a beautiful harmony if, uh, of different colors, right? Or a beautiful symphony of different notes if we understand that we work together, right, for the common good. That's the Catholic understanding. That's how we avoid all these uh, silly divisions. Our differences are good. We have a blessed inequality as we have different talents by nature and we complement each other when we work for the common good. But so to man and woman with different roles. Man being the head of the family, what are his talents? We would describe him as a stronger, more independent, less emotional. He can uh, thus and should think in a more objective fashion, okay? Trying to manner, trying to uh, direct all to the common good. And so let's apply, apply that to Adam, who was given the task, right? What it was his manly task? To go out, to leave the home. Hence, he needs to be more detached. He needs to do a hard physical work in tilling and cultivating. He needs to protect the family, likewise, from any uh, harmful animal or to hunt, etc., to harm from any attack. So those are his talents, if he uses them for the common good. They are also his weak points if he uses them for his self, his self and for egoism. And so that's where we see now the life, the story of Adam has an echo, right? So we examine our first father, we find that weak point in us as men, right? That we can use our independence are being less emotional is simply to detach and to dominate others with our strength and to use others for our own selfish end. So again, it's the same complementary talents which make sense and perfect us when we use them to serve each other. And so we see that Adam thus received a penance to, uh, to work the earth, but now amidst storms and the sweat of his brow, it's going to be difficult and that in, he is from dust, and unto dust he shall return. And that by fulfilling this penance of working, 
for the sake of his family, is going to sanctify himself. And thus, uh, we hold that Adam uh, did complete his penance, but had to wait, of course, till the blood of Christ, the new Adam, was shed upon him. That's what the name Golgotha means, the place of the skull, whose skull? The most ancient tradition of the most brilliant authors, like Origen, uh, in the earliest centuries, uh, refer to that tradition that Melchizedek had brought the, uh, the remains of Adam to that place. And that's why the Jews called it the place of the skull, namely Adam's skull. But we see Christ as a new Adam, as we see him in a garden as well, right? We see him with a test of taking of this chalice, and we hear him repeating, not my will, but thine be done, what Adam should have said. We see him uh, working amidst thorns, with thorns upon his head, and that he's offering that up in reparation for our pride. And likewise, we see him uh, before a tree. Now the tree of death becomes a tree of life, from which there flows forth blood and water. And now we which we receive in the fruit of eternal life in the most blessed sacrament, okay, which uh, culminates what we receive in baptism, that same grace to make us fully incorporated into Christ. So we see our Lord himself uh, giving us the example of fatherhood to all men, and that laying down that law that he who seeks to save his life will lose it. Men, he who tries to live just for himself will lose his life. Fathers, I've quoted to you before, St. John Chrysostom, where he says, uh, applying the parable of the talents, the man who preserved his talent that he had received from God was condemned. You're supposed to multiply them. He said, of much more value than talents of gold are, is your wife and your children, okay? That they are to grow in holiness. From what you've received, you form the kingdom of God, that domestic church. And St. Paul says, then, and later on in the Ephesians, you will have to present that bride, your family, spotless before God. That's your labor in this life. And what a beautiful labor. See, the Christ and, and likewise chose to rise again with his wounds on his side, on his, uh, on his hands and feet, and over his heart. And that's how he appears in the Sacred Heart, to remind us that that, that lance uh, pierced all the way to his heart. Okay? That's where the blood and water of redemption came from. And again, that's the mystery of fatherhood, a father who sacrifices himself for the love of others. And we see that as a, uh, as a part of the mystery of justice and mercy, which the father represents. I don't know how ancient the custom is, but when I heard about it uh, before my ordination, I bestowed upon my father uh, the stole of my first confession. Okay? So what does the father represent as the head, but justice within the family? But he's the just judge who in this life wishes to apply mercy, who wishes to sacrifice himself so that, that uh, others may live. That's the life of the father, no? Who goes out every day and, and sacrifices himself again and again to give freely to provide for his family okay? and the imitation of Christ. It's, it is the mystery of the sacred heart. And so uh, we recall today to further motivate all fathers, that what do we hear from St. Paul? That omnis paternitas, ex quo omnis paternitas in celis et in terra nominata, that all paternity on, in heaven and on earth is named, is derived from God the Father. So that's the, that's the reality of your fatherhood. You have it by participation. You exercise that sacred office in virtue of God the Father, okay? who conferred it upon you. There's no authority which doesn't come from the authority of God. And the most natural is that of paternity. Okay? And so you've received this, and that's the key to living it well, is that you've received it. You didn't earn it, nor will you keep it simply by your own efforts. You must first be a man of prayer. You will receive a, a greater participation of the perfection of that paternity the more you draw close to God. And that begins on our knees. Right? We have the example of St. Joseph. You read St. Joseph here behind me. Here's a man who's the least holiest in the Holy Family, perhaps the least intelligent compared to the Immaculate Conception and, and divine wisdom incarnate. He felt inadequate for the task and wanted to dismiss his wife as he felt he wasn't called to be in this mystery of the virgin who 
uh, was bearing Emmanuel, God with us. But he always relied on God, although he felt unworthy and didn't know what to do or how to resolve the difficulty, God spoke to him because he was a man of such uh, uh, dedication to prayer that he could even hear God in his dreams, in his sleep. Okay? So whenever he's in trouble or difficulty, he waits for the word of God and responds immediately. So we see him as, 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 a, as a father and a husband once, from his wife, from his kids, that obedience, trust me, follow me. We have to first model it for our family. Okay? That we have to first uh, be that example of obedience and docility to God. That example speaks louder than words, as we all know. I recall, too, a wonderful anecdote of my priesthood in doing a 50th anniversary for a couple. It was a couple that happened to invite us to their house in Guadalajara, and by that invitation of Mikasa Sukasa, our whole apostle there developed. As I went back to visit and met the cardinal, and he invited us, and now it's a beautiful apostle with so many souls and families that have been transformed and sanctified, beginning with that act of charity. But I remember doing their 50th anniversary, and, and uh, the nine kids, 50 grandkids, uh, all going to Mass still, quite a moral miracle in our day. And uh, one of the grandkids said that he couldn't make it uh, to, to the anniversary because he had joined the military, because he wanted to be like his grandfather. So he was sacrificing being there for that special celebration because he wanted to imitate his grandfather, who was always ready to sacrifice himself for others, whom I observed every day getting up early in the morning, saying his prayers, and then continuing to counsel his kids, his grandkids, asking me to say masses for them, never, uh, uh, never stopped being a loving father. And that, that, in, that example had impacted even the grandkids, now the great grandkids for generations and generations. And so let us on this day honor our fathers, appreciate all that they do for us, knowing that again, and as we as subjects to our fathers, whether spiritual or in the family, that we can reverence the authority and the paternity of God in them, okay? That's, that gives us a motive, right? For when they don't seem so like unto God at times, you know, we might perceive their faults. Nonetheless, we know that it's a sacred office and we have a reverence for that. And often in showing that reverence to them, it reminds them of their dignity, right? And their duty thus to, to act according to the likeness of God our Father. And so let it not go unpassed. Uh, this day, the, let us, uh, the uh, honor that we owe to our fathers. Okay? It's like uh, some have asked at times, there was a movement, certain movement to say, oh, we should have a feast in honor of God the Father. <laughs> the church has uh, rep uh, reproved such an idea, saying we don't have feasts in honor of individual divine persons, only in terms of their missions. But the other point is that the whole liturgy is directed to God the Father. I hope you didn't miss that. <laughs> the most sacred prayer, every collect, uh, is directed to the Father through the Son. The most sacred canon starts Te Ichitor Clementissime Pater. Everything is going to our most clement, most loving Father. And then it culminates in reciting the Pater Noster at the end. Okay? And so let us, uh, it's often so present to us that we take it for granted, as we often do fatherhood uh, in our families. And so we thank you, fathers. We pray for you, especially on this day. And remember that the mystery of your fatherhood is the mystery of the Sacred Heart, who tells us, Behold the heart which has so loved mankind that it has spared nothing, even to exhausting and, and consuming itself, in order to testify its love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.